can be also achieved See, if we find other methods of reducing the insulin levels which was what done by the low carbohydrate diets the low calorie diet we all know that very low calorie diets are those with less than 800 calories of intake per day and they can result in a very rapid improvement in both the glycemic parameters and also the weight reduction as early as one week it was lim et al in 2011 who showed that insulin secretion can be normalized by using a low calorie diet of less than 600 calories within about 8 weeks of time this led to the direct trial by professor roy taylor but what we must understand is low calorie diet is not a joke it has serious repercussions and if not done properly there are almost 60 reported deaths in the literature while following the very low calorie diet the reason being a lot of ventricular arrhythmias because of uh, pancreas i mean uh, micronutrient deficiencies and also protein malnutrition so based on these reported deaths the codex standards of very low calorie diet was introduced which made it mandatory for anybody who employs a low calorie diet to provide at least more than 50 grams of protein also provide adequate essential amino acids and good quantity of micronutrients because whenever you lose weight you need more quantity of micronutrients so with all that there are further setbacks of the low calorie diet one is the reduction of the lean mass and also the reduction in the resting metabolic rate which can lead to a rebound weight gain and loss of remission over a period of time that's what we are seeing in the direct trial which started with 46% remission in the first year is now having a 36% remission at the second year switching over to the low carbohydrate diets which are now becoming popular both with the ada and the general public you call it as a low carb diet when you give less than 130 grams of carbs per day and ketogenic when it is less than 30 grams of carbs per day a meta analysis of three rcts using a low carb diet showed a low remission rate of 10% when the definition included medication without medication it was only 4% in fact tomorrow you have a talk by dr anjana mohan about reduction of carbohydrates and remission of diabetes with the ketogenic diet there is no rct it's just a parallel prospective study done by verta which showed a remission rate of 20% at one year there are a lot of setbacks with the low carbohydrate diet the low carbohydrate diet essentially focuses on the meal macronutrient composition alone but forgets to take care of the person who eats the food so if you look at various variables the meal macronutrient composition impacts the glucose aoc only by 16% the rest of it the other variables like age sex the bmi the genetics the hbnc of that patient the gut microbiome and even the meal context when the same food with the same low carbohydrate diet whether it's taken for breakfast lunch and dinner can make a big impact on the aoc and also to consider is not everybody is sensitive to the carbohydrate content there are people who are sensitive to the carbohydrate content in the meal and some who are not sensitive to the carbohydrate content of the meal all this is not taken care of when we prescribe a low carbohydrate diet so to give you a overall picture you can see the macronutrient composition is only about 16 to 30% impact on the aoc whereas the rest of it depends on various individual factors such as the microbiome the meal timing the medication that the patient is taking the timing of the meal sleep that the patient has had exercise all of that will decide on the aoc for a particular meal for that particular person so we can see that 
when you employ the postprandial uh, glucose response as the measure of healthy nutrition the reason being it can directly impact on the insulin levels thereby affecting the fat storage and is also associated with uh, multiple disease conditions such as diabetes obesity cardiovascular disease and uh, many other chronic metabolic conditions and it is easily measurable parameter that we can all employ and you can see that the dietary interventions which target the postprandial glucose also induce a very consistent change in the gut microbiota thereby leading to a long term change in the diabetes remission in our study which has already completed one year the blood glucose measurement for 200 of our patients is about 6 lakh 50000 65 lakhs measurements and rather than just going by the food uh, recall uh, which is usually done in most nutritional studies we had an app installed where each meal of the patient was logged into the app and you can see more than 1 lakh 40000 meals were recorded by the patients into the app so now let's say we did give a standard meal of 3 idlis to our patients and based on the glycemic response we expect a particular kind of response and you will be surprised to see the results that we had in our patients you can see that there is so much of interpersonal variation that you see when the same food with uh, the same macronutrients and calories were given to different patients so that being the case we also need to understand the postprandial glucose response to a particular meal even for a particular individual is not static it can change dynamically over a period of time based on his change in the bmi his hbnc change all of that as you can see six three months in the program this same set of patients had a better postprandial glycemic response to the same plate of idli that they had which they did not have 6 months ago so this is the key foundation of our uh, trial and you can see putting it in a graphical format with a heat map the patient's response with red in the beginning changing towards the green showing that as their parameters improved their glycemic uh, response improved we cannot expect to have patients on cgm and therefore also measure their postprandial glucose response and keep them on the cgm forever we need to find some way of getting out of the cgm and that can be only possible with machine learning and artificial intelligence which can predict the postprandial glycemic response of an in, for an individual so here our engineers who are based in california and india they used all these uh, Uh, features including the demographic information of a patient his activity levels which are measured by the fitbit watch his sleep data again from the fitbit watch the blood test parameters the food nutrition which was logged into the app the recent glucose features the medications that they were taking the time of the day that meal was logged into the app with all this we were able to predict the post meal uh, glucose response without a cgm looking at the accuracy that we were able to achieve through this uh, machine learning uh, algorithms you can see that this is a connected app which inputs all the data of the app patient to the algorithm which learns from the patient and then starts giving recommendations for that patient here we need to understand what is good food for one person may be bad food for another person and <coughs> this is always guided by a physician and a coach who guides the patient regarding medication change and here is our <coughs> actual cgm data of our patient and if you look at the prediction that we were able to do for this patients it was as accurate to the level of 7 mg per deciliter this high level of accuracy i will just show you is the reason is because we did not depend only on the carbohydrate content of the food as you can see from this study by zv et al where if you use only the carbohydrate content of the food you achieve a r value of only 0.38 and when you use all this personal characteristics of the patient your accuracy improves to 0.68 and you can 
Use the same prediction in patients whom, with whom you don't have the CGM data. So you can see that with machine learning and artificial intelligence, our program was able to deliver nutritional recommendations via the app and with the guidance of doctors and uh, coaches. But again, we cannot have patients on multiple sensors for a long time. As you can see, the digital twin or the avatar that we call learns from the patient and doesn't need more and more sensors as time goes. And you can see by six months, the only two sensors that we need is a body composition scale and a Fitbit watch. You don't even need the CGM. So we presented recently our uh, three uh, papers for the RCT of uh, six months which was uh, submitted to the ADA conference recently and ADA tweeted this uh, particular uh, artificial intelligence statement which showed a significant rate of remission compared to standard care. And we had three uh, presentations. One was uh, by Professor Joshi and we had uh, two uh, poster presentations and we also had a media presentation at the ADA which is quite rare where the ADA president, Dr. Joshi, and our chief medical officer and myself were there. And I'll just show you the RCT results that we did. Just before that, I would like to show you the study design, where this is an actual randomized study which was registered on the CTRI website. And we included patients of more than eight, uh, less than eight years of duration, whereas the direct trial had only patients of less than six years. There was no limit on the HBNC inclusion criteria, whereas the direct trial had a 9% cutoff. We had about 12 patients on insulin, while the direct trial did not have patients on insulin. So with this design, when we started the study, with this CGM we could see a significant reduction of time above range within 30 days of time. And you can see that the reduction of time over range was maintained throughout the six months period compared to the controls who are at a much higher level. The same improvement can also be seen in the time in range, the estimated A1C, the HV A1C as you can see which started from 8.4 reached a mean level of 5.7 in six months of time. And the curious part is the diabetes medication change. You can see that Within 30 days of time, all these patients who started with 1, 2, 3 and 4 and 5 uh, medications at baseline in the intervention arm were able to get off medication within 30 days of time which is unimaginable. And only a small percentage of patients who did not achieve remission by the current standards of uh, care uh, of definition of remission was uh, on metformin. Whereas on the control arm, as we see in the real world, they had to take more and more medications to improve their HVNC. You can see that on the right hand side. Like I said, fasting insulin is a key factor in remission and you can see how there is a good difference of uh, fasting insulin from baseline to six months in the intervention arm compared to the control arm. We have also demonstrated improvement in the Pathophysiology of diabetes getting better with improvement in HOMA 2 IR and also the HOMA 2 B in the six months of time in the intervention arm. And we were lucky to have uh, Professor Taylor also by the side uh, uh, on a, with his own poster. Why I put up this poster is basically to say we should not be enthused with Western data and we cannot easily extrapolate population uh, data to our population. We found significant difference of the numbers when we compared it to the direct trial. I will be just showing it in a minute. So you can see here on the right hand side the direct trial with varying degrees of weight loss there was a significant change in the rates of remission. Whereas in our Indian population you can see five out of six patients who even gained weight were able to achieve remission. And you can see we had a significant number of patients who lost 5 kg, 5 to 10 kg. And we had 63 patients who lost more than 10 kg. And we have about 39 patients who lost more than 15 kg. And you can see that as the weight 
loss increases, the remission rate improves. But this is totally uh, not matching or going along with the direct uh, trial results. And you can see that the baseline HBNC of the direct trial was somewhere above 7, while we started at 8.9 and you can see we had a 3.3% A1C reduction and our uh, remission rate was much higher at 84%. Compare that to 46% achieved in the direct trial. Along with that we also saw a lot of improvement in the other parameters like uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity and also NFLD. And we have a series of publications which we have uh, provided as evidence to the m medical uh, community. I just won't go through each one of them. We have about 33 publications in the uh, conferences and uh, various journals. What I would like to say in the end is that big data has to be tamed by artificial intelligence and machine learning and that's what we are doing at Digital Twin. We are not replacing doctors. We are enabling doctors to achieve remission through the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I would like to thank my team of uh, Dr. Joshi, who is our chief medical scientist, Dr. Bansi Sabu, Dr. Suresh, and uh, Dr. Kaufman, who is the former EDA president, who are the key opinion leaders uh, for our company along with my other principal investigators, Dr. Mala Dharmalingam, uh, Dr. Arun, Dr. Ashok and all my other colleagues at uh, TWIN. Thank you so much.